Tonight, we are honored to have with us Linda Greenhouse, uh, who has written a fascinating book, Justice on the Brink. Linda is a uh, member of the faculty of the Yale Law School, and she is currently teaching a clinic on the Supreme Court and has been, we've just been chatting about some of the fascinating cases that she and her students have been uh, reviewing. Uh, she is a Pulitzer Prize winning author, and I encourage you to read Justice on the Brink because it is both about the personalities of the members of the Supreme Court, as well as various cases that they are dealing with uh, currently. One of the insights, you know, we hear so much about abortion and guns, but Linda makes a fascinating case that religion has become a new uh, focal point for this Supreme Court. And I'm sure that uh, uh, there'll be a number of questions about that because she is being interviewed tonight by Tamla Edwards of ABC Channel 6. And she, of course, has done such a wonderful job uh, both at Channel 6 and also as being a friend of the Free Library with the interviewing that she has done with our various authors. So without further ado, I welcome Linda Greenhouse and I turn it over to Tamla Edwards. Thank you all for joining us. Go Free Library. <laughs> Go Free Library indeed. Morris, thank you. And Linda, welcome. It is an honor to have you here and looking forward to the next hour. I enjoy Justice on the Brink and there's so much to dig into. So let's get going. And I wanted to start with why you decided, like what was the germination of, I wanna write this book right now, not in a year or two, but at this moment in this nascent moment with Amy Coney Barrett, as she's just stepping onto the court versus in a year or two after we've kind of seen the path of some of her rulings. Well, the, the, the year promised to be really so extraordinary because remember the trajectory from Ruth Ginsburg's death in mid-September uh, by the time <clears throat> Donald Trump went into the Rose Garden and nominated Amy Barrett, Justice Ginsburg had not even been buried. The election was in full swing. There were weeks to go before election day, but in many states there was early voting. People were actually voting. And so everything kind of came together. The, the, the crazy election period and this sudden death and the norm breaking uh, nomination. And so it just seemed this was a time, of course, and I had the time during the pandemic uh, to try to chronicle and put between hard covers what that year was gonna be like. So I, I wrote the book in real time. Uh, each chapter is a month. Uh, as I, as I say at the end of the book, I didn't go back to kind of clean up what I said about that month <laughs> and make myself look smart. It just was as, as it appeared to me uh, as it was happening. And, and so I hope that the book will be, uh, you know, not only something that will inform people's understanding of what's happening right now, but has, has made a historic record about a very historic sequence of events. You've watched the court for a very long time. And what was the emotion you felt when you saw that chain of events, that beginning chain of events, Ginsburg dies, Barrett is appointed, she's standing there in the Rose Garden. If you had to pick one emotion to describe as somebody who understands the court so well, what was it? Shock, I think, uh, you know, we had, remember Bill Clinton who, spent you know weeks and months deciding who he wanted to put on the Supreme Court. We had the weirdness of what happened to President Obama after Justice Scalia died in the blockade for you know much of a year of, of that seat. You know, and then all of a sudden like a whiplash, you know, as as I said, I mean RBG had not even been buried. And we we had this this announcement. So um, I was just kind of in a state of shock as, as a citizen, uh, as well as someone who has chronicled and written about the court for, for a long time. And starting with Ginsburg, you know, there had been, and you chronicle it in the book, 
a long running debate around her and now around Justice Breyer, should they have stepped down and made sure that a Democratic president, Obama for Ginsburg, Biden for Breyer, Breyer would get an opportunity to name their replacement. In fact, Noah Feldman, which is funny because he's the person saying, don't push Justice Breyer because he will think that it's partisan. But he was writing today about the book that had she stepped down, we wouldn't be here. And I wondered about your thought on that assessment, or is that assumptive? The court can take this crazy trajectory in history, and you can say, if she had stepped down, we wouldn't be here. But you really never know. Well, you never know. I mean, if Scalia hadn't died, if, you know, Mitch McConnell hadn't controlled his caucus, if, you know, I mean, uh, I, I, I've done my share of reviewing books. Okay. <laughs> Somebody once said to me, uh, gave me the rule number one of reviewing a book, and, and I've tried to take that to heart, which is review the book the author wrote, not the book that you think the author should have written, okay? <laughs> so I did not write a book that blamed Ruth Bader Ginsburg for all the ills that have befallen the country uh, in these last, you know, uh, four or five years. Um, you know, do I think she should have stepped down? You know, she placed a bet. And she assumed that Hillary Clinton was going to get elected in 2016. Um, you know, put your hand up if you dare, if you were someone who did not have that assumption. And, you know, had she made it for another four months, um, President Joe Biden would have named her successor. So, you know, I, I, I'll say that. And then I'll also say that it was during those last years of her tenure the last, I say 10 years, and the, the male professoriate started telling her to retire in around 2010, I think, um, that, we, that we saw the notorious RBG, that we saw her using her voice in dissent to call out what she thought was unfortunate about the turn the court had started taking after Sandra O'Connor retired in 2006 and was replaced by Justice Alito, we wouldn't have heard her. And, you know, there was a sense in which we needed her. Uh, and so had she taken the, you know, the guy's advice, uh, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have had her. And you made a, an interesting point that many of us didn't know until the very end how sick she was. We just knew she could do more push-ups than anyone else that you knew, no matter what the age. Yeah. Um, Morris pointed out that you do a great job of giving us portraits of the justices and who they are as we walk into this moment. And so, as I told you, I wanted to sort of go through them a little bit and ask some questions. And I wanted to start with John Roberts, which, you know, you write about his efforts to hold the court, to find majorities and try to move it towards people thinking it's more apolitical, but you know that he's a little by little kind of guy and that he very much so has a hand in why we're in this conservative moment. And so I thought I'd start with him. Yeah, you know, there's a great irony to uh, John Roberts' position. So if Hillary Clinton had become president and filled the Scalia vacancy, John Roberts, one might say, would have become irrelevant. And Ruth Ginsburg would have been running the court because there would have been five justices to John Roberts' left. Ironically, with the three Trump justices, he threatens to become irrelevant, even though Hillary Clinton didn't win, uh, because there are now five justices to his right. So he's in an incredibly, I say almost poignant historical position. His name is on the door. It's the Roberts Court. He's a figure of history. Uh, he's going to be, history will judge uh, how well he managed this historic moment. And um, I, I, the more I think about it, the more empathy I have for, for the, the position that, that he's in. He's somebody who uh, is in really masterful control of his public persona. We don't know what he really thinks. He doesn't really share that with us. He's not much of a public figure in that way, although he's one of the most powerful people in the country or was. Um, it's a fascinating position that he's in. Is there any precedent? I mean, he can't be the first justice who would have thought herding cats is a better job. Um, 
is there anything that they can do, any power he can exert, or really he's just the first among nine and he really doesn't have that much sway? Well, at the, you know, kind of basic civics level, he's one vote. And, uh, you know, as I, I say in the book, when, when uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist died and uh, Ruth Ginsburg in her statement, she said, he was the fairest boss I ever had. I, I'm sure she meant that ironically because the Chief Justice is not the boss of anybody. Uh, he, he does, I say he because we've never had a female Chief Justice. Uh, he does have the power to assign opinions if he's in the majority. And that's, you know, that's a not insubstantial power in that it makes a big difference, say you're on the conservative side of the court, it makes a big difference whether you give the assignment to Sam Alito, Clarence Thomas, Brett Kavanaugh, and so on. So he can, you know, kind of uh, maneuver at the margins, but when push comes to shove, he really is just one vote. And in fact, I told you, I think your next book should be about Samuel Alito, who doesn't get as much of the spotlight as maybe some other people do, but it's, it sounds in the book as though he's really the old bull here. And I thought you, you created an interesting juxtaposition that Sandra Day O'Connor becomes more moderate over time when she's on the court and seems to have a view for finding the middle. It feels as though his conservatism becomes more muscular and more angry. And we're really starting to see that flare out in public. And I wanted to know more about that and to what degree it influences the younger conservative justices around him. Uh, that's a really good question. I mean, he, he, he does project a kind of anger. And I and a lot of other people I know have always wondered, what is he angry about? He's had a great ride, you know? I mean, he ends up on the US Supreme Court. Uh, he's, you know, he's someone to contend with. What is he so angry about? And, and so his, his challenge, if I were a coach for, for Sam Alito, I would say, Sam, you know, curb your enthusiasm. You're, you, you risk overplaying your hand here. I read a coach. Now, Amy Barrett hasn't had the occasion to do much in her time on the court. You know, she hasn't written any, ma any major majority opinions and so on and so on. But she's written two things that I think are quite suggestive. Uh, one was last term in, in, in the book, um, a separate opinion she wrote in the court's big religion case, which had to do with what people here know, the city of Philadelphia, mm -hmm. um, the, the Fulton case. Alito wrote a very angry, very long opinion saying the court's not going far enough, fast enough, you know, you're wimping out. And she wrote just a couple of paragraphs and she said, um, I agree with this outcome, but I don't think we have to go all the way at this point. Uh, we need more nuance, not a word that's often heard from the conservative side of the court. So that's data point one. Data point two came less than two weeks ago when uh, the court was asked by uh, eight healthcare workers in Maine who were seeking a religious exemption from the back state's vaccine mandate. They came up to the court, they said, this is a horrible uh, you know, uh, defeat of our religious interests. And uh, they got three votes, only three votes. They got Gorsuch, Alito, and Thomas. Gorsuch wrote, I think, wrote for the three, but it, it really had a lot of Alito's voice in there. And Amy Barrett did not join them. She wrote a separate paragraph and she said, um, you know, I'm, I'm not there. Uh, I don't think this is the right case. I don't think this is the right move. And we're just gonna let this mandate take effect. And I, I, so I read both of those, the one in the Fulton case last term and the one uh, the other day as, as really saying to Alito, you know, don't take my vote for granted. Sure, we're both conservative judicially and religiously, but I'm not your girl. I, I, I'm gonna go my own way and don't overplay your hand. And I just think it's a fascinating 
moment that not enough people have, have noticed actually. You know, people have been so assumptive about her. That's it, Roe v. Wade is overturned, that we're going to see some very conservative opinions. Those two things, did that sort of make your ears perk up and say, this woman may yet be full of surprises in terms of how she rules and where we're going? I, I think so. I mean, uh, I, I, don't, I don't take anything about her for granted. I don't take for granted the kind of one-dimensional cartoon figure that she was made out to be by the Democrats when she was nominated. Um, I don't think she's going to undergo a Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, you know, change of her basic ideology. Um, I think it's somewhere in between, and I, I'm very fascinated to see what that may be. Um, I have the sense that maybe she doesn't know. She's going to take it case by case as it comes, and um, you know, be, be be the best Justice Barrett that she that that she can be. Well, personally, I'm going to disagree with her quite a lot. I think. But, <laughs> But, I think it's sort of a brave stance that she's willing to say, I want to take my time and to not feel forced to come out of the, the barrel of the gun. And, you know, you, we've made it through half of the conservatives. Thomas, you know, you paint as a bit quixotic that sometimes he goes where you think he will and other times he pursues kind of his own legal theories. That leaves the other two Trump appointees, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh. And you almost can hear the other justices going, what a twerp when it comes to Gorsuch, who seems to love his own thinking. But Kavanaugh was more fascinating to me. You, you had a line in there that rather than ending up where you know he's going to end up, he almost takes the scenic route to prove he looked at everything. It's yeah. almost as if he doesn't trust himself. Well, I, I'm not sure it's that so much as he wants the public to think that he's approached everything with an open mind. And, you know, I'm not saying that he hasn't, but after he goes through that exercise of telling us in public, you know, here's what I considered and here's what I thought, he always ends up on the conservative side. So, you know, I think it's a bit of a, a bit of a show that he's uh, treating us to actually. Do you think that means he may be open to John Roberts coming to him and saying, and Elena Kagan, who also tries to get them together to say, listen, the public thinks we are partisan. The public thinks that this is a charade in here and we need you since you care about what it looks like on the outside to every now and then come with us out of the conservative majority and stand over here. Do you think he'd be persuaded by that? Well, I'll say I cannot imagine John Roberts ever engaging in such a colloquy. That's just not how they behave. But, um, but no, I mean, Look at what, what happened on September 1st when the court allowed the Texas, what I call the vigilante law, SB8, to go into effect. Uh, the vote was five to four. Uh, it takes five votes to grant a stay. So there were only four who voted to grant the stay, Roberts and the three liberals, um, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. You know, could, Kavan could it have killed Kavanaugh to come over and you know, give Roberts a little cover and be a fifth vote just to grant a stay. They're not asked to strike down the law, just grant a stay so we can think about it when the formal appeal comes in. No. So from that, I think that was just a extremely telling moment that Kavanaugh could have done one thing and he chose to do the other thing. Let's talk about some of the issues that are facing this court that have been big this year. Let's start with abortion. There are two cases that you point out, you know, one more recently, the Texas case before that, the Mississippi case, the Texas case, when you listen to the arguments, especially Barrett, they seem to want to talk more about the way the law is applied, this idea of vigilante citizens, less so than abortion itself. Was that your perspective? Oh, yes. I mean, <clears throat> and that's, you know, that's the way it should have been, because the case that the court agreed to decide in the Texas context was not about the right to abortion. It was, do federal courts have jurisdiction, to, can exercise jurisdiction over this statute that was written to deprive the courts of jurisdiction? 
So it really was a case about process. Now, of course, it's hard to totally disentangle process from the, the cutoff of the actual, the access to a constitutional right, which is the impact of, of the law. But, um, but the court certainly knows that on December 1st, they're gonna hear, you know, that, that's the main chance to really um, get their hands on the right itself. And then there's the Mississippi case. And I warned Linda before we started, I've been through zero days of law school. So my understandings of cases uh, may not be quite right, but my sensibility, this idea of questioning uh, the attorney general who you point out as a political figure who seems as though she's gunning to run for governor one day and her arguments around the line of when abortion is no longer a viable thing and wanting to, I believe it's 15 weeks, uh, go from the end of the second trimester to 15 weeks. That's interesting to me because I wondered if you thought that would be a salient argument with the justices that the science has changed, that what we could do at the time of Roe, what was viable then versus what is viable now, that that to me seemed like now there's a door they might go through. Well, of course, the fact is the science hasn't changed and it's essentially the same as it was uh, in 1973, when the court decided Roe, in 1992, in Planned Parenthood against Casey, another case from Philadelphia, from Pennsylvania, uh, where the court upheld the right to abortion. Uh, so the notion that science has changed is to totally, totally phony. Uh, but I, I, I'll say this. So ever since Roe, almost 50 years ago, the court has maintained that before fetal viability, which is 23, 24 weeks, a woman has an absolute right to choose to terminate the pregnancy. You can make the woman crawl through all kinds of hoops and stand on her head and you know recite all kinds of stuff, but at the end of the day, it's her choice before fetal viability. The 15-week ban in Mississippi is designed to challenge that, to test that, and viability has been the firewall that has protected the right to abortion. If you breach that firewall, there's no obvious reason why you wouldn't go down to 10 weeks or six weeks like in Texas or zero weeks. That I think is a law that is either pending or about to pass in Arkansas. Um, so if they breach that firewall, if they uphold the 15 week ban, in my opinion, the right to abortion is gone. And you probably know this better than I do. Is there an argument that somebody would make? Because you see people say all the time, the baby was born early and the hospital managed to keep him alive and look at him now, he's 6'3". I don't know, is that, do we have any of those cases before what's judged to be viability? Or all those cases have generally been babies born after that seven, eight, nine month mark. Do you happen to know? Well, certainly there's never been a viable fetus at 15 weeks. That's not possible. No, I meant more like when you get to like 23, 24. Yeah, I mean, certainly there are, I mean, that's that's deemed to be the, the mark of, of viability. So, I mean, there are extremely premature babies at maybe 22 weeks of pregnancy, um, you know, who with good medical care, you know, CHOP or whatever, um, you, you know, can can survive, although many of them um, survive with substantial impairments. Um, but nothing that, that substantially changes the science or changes what we no, know. There's nothing that nothing has changed the changed the science. I mean, if, you know, eventually maybe it'll be an artificial womb or something like that. But um, but that's all science fiction at this at this point. And I, I'm sure everybody watching this is wondering whether or not you think between these two cases, we are going to see an overturning or a substantial changing in what has been precedent here. Oh, I think so. I mean, whether Roe is overturned explicitly or simply functionally because of what I said about the viability firewall, um, sure, because they had no other reason to take the Mississippi case. In the Mississippi ban, uh, there are Many, basically all the red states have passed laws like this in one way or another. And all the federal courts have declared those laws unconstitutional as the federal courts did in, in this case, because on the face of it, they are unconstitutional. If you assume the constitutional interpretation of the right to abortion is what it has been for almost 
50 years. So in other words, there was no conflict among the lower courts. And that's the major reason why the Supreme Court will take a case. If there's an important issue that the lower courts disagree about, the court will step in and say, well, we need a national rule. The rule has, you know, the law has to be the same thing in Pennsylvania as it means in California. That wasn't the case here. There was no conflict, but they took it anyway. And as I chronicle in the book, they took it after months of mysterious discussion about it that never became public, but week after week after week, they would meet about it to just, you know, waiting to decide whether to take this case, which they finally did in May. Um, so very deliberately decided to take it. And there's only one reason to take it, which is to think that it's time to change the law. I wanted to ask you about gun rights, which is obviously a big deal in Philadelphia. We are closing in on 500 murders in this city. And there's always a push. I know you can't, it's, it's a shocking number. And of course there have been efforts to try to have gun control, which always fail in front of the law. So that's one that a lot of people here are watching. And it seemed to me as though Thomas and Alito in particular and Gorsuch as well, they really wanna get their hands on a gun rights case and substantially expand our understanding of second amendment rights. Oh, for sure. I mean, they've been, the court has turned down almost every case uh, since 2008 when the court, <clears throat> excuse me, when the court decided the Heller case and for the first time said the Second Amendment gives an individual a right to keep a gun at home <clears throat> for self defense. And every case that the court has turned down since then, Thomas or Alito or more recently Gorsuch has said, we're turning the second amendment into a second class right. And we need to change that. Um, and they finally got their case. And I think one way or another, um, the second amendment will be interpreted. The question in this case is what, what are the requirements? How, how restrictive can a state be <clears throat> about allowing licenses, granting licenses for concealed carry outside the home? And New York has quite a restrictive law, one of the more restrictive in the country. Uh, and I think um, that law is not going to survive this uh, examination by the court. You know, I think a lot of us look at Texas where it feels as though they want to give a kid a rattle and a gun at the rate they're going. And do you think ultimately we're going to see an expansion where more states than not under these courts rulings, there's going to be a lot more people walking around with guns? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the argument went to, well, <clears throat> you know, assuming we allow more concealed carry, are there, are there places where it can be limited within the meaning of the Second Amendment? How about uh, <clears throat> campuses? One question was, how about the subway and all this kind of thing? And, you know, the court is really um, opening a can of worms if it goes that root because is the court going to become the de facto, you know, gun license issuer for the country in specifying it can be here but not there. And I don't know, they seem to be willing to to go down that road and then uh, you know the country is going to have to live with that. I wanted you to talk a little bit about your observation of where we're going after this last year on religion. Because if I got it right, it's it, we started with religion can be treated no worse than any other law. That now it's religion should be treated as well as the best. And we may be headed towards religion as its own thing, treated better than anything else. That if I just say I'm doing X, Y, and Z because of a religious holding, I have opened up a new set of rights. Am I reading that correctly? Where are we going here? Oh, you are reading it correctly. And in fact, one of the major things that happened in this past term happened right after Amy Barrett came on the court within her first uh, week or two. Before she came on the court, when Ruth Ginsburg was still alive, the court during the pandemic had had a couple of these cases challenging the capacity limitations that various jurisdictions had put on, you know, where people could gather, how many people could gather uh, for this reason, for that reason, for religious worship. And churches had challenged saying, you know, you're limiting us to X and we really need X plus, you know, 100 or whatever. 
uh, in our sanctuary. And the court had rejected these claims by votes of five to four, the chief justice writing that, you know, in a public health emergency, we judges should defer to the public health experts, right? Hardly seems like rocket science. Anyway, uh, the first one of these cases that came up after Justice Barrett was there, uh, from, it was a case from New York, the court flipped and it was five to four the other way. And the capacity limitation was held to violate the right to free exercise. So that was just a, a I'd say a straw in the wind. It was more important than that. Um, and we went on from there, uh, more explicit cases, the Philadelphia case that where the court struck down uh, the ability of Philadelphia to require that its social service contractors honor the non-discrimination principle uh, in the city ordinance and in the contract. And there's a big uh, school case coming up, going to be argued next month about uh, the whether states are obliged to provide the same kind of tuition assistance to attend a parochial school that they do to attend a secular school. That's a major, major breach in precedent that's about to occur. So religion is where a lot of the kind of cultural and political pressures are, are playing out right now. And, and the court is a full participant in that. I'm sure you've been thinking about this. How does it change us? How does it change us as a country? Um, you know, most school children can tell you separation of church and state. They may not know what it means, but they've heard it. What happens if our fundamental understanding of religion and how it's treated in this country drastically changes? Well, um, we've had a series of Republican presidents who have named a series of conservative Catholic justices to the court. And you know, even to say that raises people's eyebrows because I, I think religion is the last taboo in our society. You know, you can talk about people's sexuality, people's <clears throat> gender identity, uh, all kinds of things, but you can't talk about their religion. But nonetheless, it's a fact that um, there's a majority of Catholics on the court, of conservative Catholics on the court. Uh, as to why that is, my view, and not everybody, I don't expect everybody to agree with me, but my view is that Republican presidents who are pledged by the Republican national platform <clears throat> to pick justices and judges who would overturn the right to abortion. You can't say to a potential nominee, hey, by the way, how are you gonna vote in a row against Wade? But instead you name a conservative Catholic as a proxy for, for the question that you can't ask and indeed that the nominee would not be able to answer. So we're left with <clears throat> a court a majority of which is extremely attentive to religious claims above other kinds of claims for non-discrimination, for the right to contraception, for we've seen a series of these cases and it's just gonna go on. And I think it's um, a very important social problem right now, actually. We've got three more liberal justices, Justice Breyer, who's now the senior liberal jurist, uh, Justice Kagan and Justice Sotomayor. And there's a marked difference between Justice Kagan and Justice Sotomayor in style. Kagan, a former law school dean, seems to try to figure out, is there anywhere where we can come together and find some places around the edges where we can agree? And Sotomayor, you say she is ex she's following in the footsteps of RBG and exercising what you call dimmest prudence. I'm not sure if I said that correctly, yes. where she knows, you know, I'm not going to win, but I am laying down a marker for history and speaking in a full-throated way. Which of those two do you think is more effective in terms of both within the court and within, with the public? Well, that's an interesting question. <clears throat> Which is more effective? Um, I, think we, I think we need the Sotomayor's voice to kind of call out what's happening as she did in the series really shocking series of federal executions that the Trump administration carried out in its last seven months. Um, and I think we need 
and Elena Kagan, who is using her um, really great abilities to, to work with legal materials. Um, and and I, I think she has had some success over time in not changing bottom line outcomes, but in succeeding in modulating the path the court takes to get to those outcomes. And sometimes the analysis the court uses is just as important as the bottom line, because what matters is going to be the next case and the case after that and the case after that. So I would hate to be put in a position that you're trying to put me in of picking the one over the other. Um, I'm glad that in this very conservative era of Supreme Court history, we have them both. You know, one thing I hadn't realized uh, until I read your book was the impact of the pandemic on the court. That there's in between when we see them publicly listening to arguments, their conferences, their private lunches, you know, there's a lot of back and forth and interplay between them, which of course went away when we all had to be socially distanced. They did a lot of things by the telephone. What do you, as you judge it looking back on this year, what has been the impact of not being able to have a more personal touch with each other? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. And, and I'm always very wary about, you know, pretending to know more than I know. But I, I do know that as you said, I mean, the, the normal pattern at the court, they make eye contact, uh, you know, on the bench uh, three days a week out of two weeks out of every month from October through April. They have their private conferences twice a week. They have lunch together the days the court's on the bench. And so, although I don't think they engage in a lot of um, sort of off the bench chatter about cases, for instance, their rule at lunch is we don't talk cases. Uh, it, somehow being together just has to have made a difference. I think it would have made a difference back in the fall a year ago, as all the election cases started coming up, um, the ones before the actual election day, were very contentious inside the court. We saw very angry dissenting opinions from Justice Alito when the court didn't take the Republican challenges that were coming up to the different ways that uh, states had, had amended, uh, because of the pandemic, amended access to the polls. Uh, I somehow think if they'd been able to look each other in the eye, they could have lowered the temperature there. And maybe had they lowered the temperature before the election, it wouldn't have given the impression that the court was available to Donald Trump after the election. The court, of course, proved not to be available. Um, so I, you know, that might might have made a difference there, but I'm 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 not I'm not a hundred percent sure. I was surprised by something you said Clarence Thomas said when asked about, because people are saying, are you guys at each other's throats? And he said, you know, I can't think of a time when anybody has raised their voice in conference, which I couldn't imagine when you are, there's so many momentous, momentous major issues with such different viewpoints. Do you think that's really the truth that they're able to, without rancor, without yelling, discuss these things? Yes, actually, I do think so. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily without rancor, but certainly without yelling. I mean, they're all, you know, they're all grown up in the in the sense that they realize that they're never going to be able to get anything done unless you get four people to go along with you. So it's not like, say, in, in the House of Representatives where there's this caucus and that caucus and, you know, maybe you're not speaking to them or whatever, whatever. You, you can't live like that. In the Supreme Court. So I think they have learned, uh, I think every justice learns to be uh, pretty well behaved. And I think they have, they have developed norms to protect that, uh, the, the quality of the interpersonal relationship. I mean, that's why, you know, we don't talk cases at lunch. Right. We don't, no talking shop. No talking shop. We don't barge into somebody else's chambers to kind of, you know, feel them out or schmooze them or whatever. Um, the interaction 
among the justices really happens on a good old fashioned way, paper, paper, they write memos and the memos are circulated among the nine chambers. And all of that is designed to channel the very strong feelings that of course they have about certain matters um, so that they can maintain a kind of a, you know, civility, even if deep down inside they're really angry about something. We've gotten in about 10 questions and I think we've got about 15, 20 minutes. So I'm gonna see if I, we can get through them. So everybody gets to jump in here. The first one is we talk so much about how the Republican agenda led by Senator McConnell has changed the political landscape in reference to the court, but to what extent do Democrats need to take ownership of the role they played in leading to the court's politiciz politiciz politicization, thinking specifically of the Bork nomination in the 80s? Is there a way back in your opinion, or is the court forever doomed to be a deeply partisan institution? Now that is a mouthful, Linda. Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of mythology about the Bork nomination and what happened, but what people maybe don't remember is that he was defeated by a strong bipartisan vote that was not a partisan vote. Um, you know, and, and, and the Barrett confirmation was actually the first time, I think in American history, or maybe only once before, that a Supreme Court justice was confirmed with no votes from the minority party. So the, the Bork battle, I could spend the rest of our time together talking about it, but. Um, but people have to realize it was a much more complicated event than the mythology has come down. So, but the question is, should the Democrats take ownership of the politicization of the court? You know, actually I'm gonna push back on that. So Bill Clinton had two nominees, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Stephen Breyer. They were both confirmed by overwhelming majorities. I think there were only two or three dissenting votes, you know, like 97 to three um, in both cases. And why was that? It's because President Clinton, uh, who uh, early in his term had a you know, strong grip on, on, on the Senate, um, played to the middle. I mean, he didn't take somebody who was known for their left-wing ideology, shall we say. Um, it's really the Republicans who've tried to use the power to put somebody on the court to advance an agenda that they had failed to advance through normal political means. Now that's a, that's a harsh judgment, but I'll, I'll stand behind that. And it kind of leads to this one. Why do you think the right has been so successful at motivating their base around Supreme Court nominations, but the left has failed to bring their voters together. You know, you talk a lot about the Federalist Society, which has been around for decades now, and we see the fruits of their labor. And you wonder, is there as muscular a progressive organization in terms of coming up with jurists for the future? And why not? Yeah, I mean, that's the observation is totally accurate. I mean, there is a progressive version of the Federalist Society, but it doesn't have the money or the clout. You know, the conservatives have played a long game in part because what they want from the courts, they can't get through normal politics. Whereas the Democrats have had a much broader political agenda and haven't seen the courts as uh, advancing that agenda more than trying to play trying to get legislation through. I mean, just look at what recently has been happening in Congress where, uh, you know, the trillion dollar package hardly got any Republican votes. I mean, why is that? The Democrats had, had a legislative agenda and the Republicans have an agenda too, which is stop anything the Democrats want. So they turned to the courts and um, they've been both strategic and lucky. It takes luck also. They've gotten the vacancies at the right time when they've had power or the power to stop as with the Scalia vacancy, which was extremely important in motivating the base. And you know, that's how we've gotten to where we are. A question about your own habits. How do you organize your research to call up exactly the background or quotes that you want? I print out a lot of things. Um, 
I, I like paper in my hands. I file a lot of things. I have lots of file drawers and filing cabinets. And, um, you know, with luck, I can remember that I have something and I can, and I can find it, but it, it's, it's a challenge. I don't, I don't have a research assistant or anything like that. So, yeah. That's amazing. I am so impressed that you did this all yourself. How do you view the Roberts Court on the activism scale, say, for example, in relation to the Warren Court, which is famous for being a more activist court? Well, I, I kind of would put them in the same uh, category, actually. I mean, what's funny is that, you know, of course, conservatives have been decrying judicial activism for as long as I've been around. And, uh, and now we see the same thing on the right, although they tend to call it judicial engagement, not judicial activism. But, um, but what one means by that, I think, is using the courts and the judicial process as an engine of change, uh, an engine of progress, an engine of change. And that's what the Warren Court did. And I think, you know, the other side of the coin is that's what's happening in our federal courts now. Okay, uh, once again, I'm trying to get to the next question. Does public opinion have any effect on how the court may rule regardless of personal conviction? Do the conservative justice truly wanna be on the record as taking established rights away? How would overruling Roe v. Wade impact other judicial precedents? And that's a question that I had. You noted in the book, I think you said two thirds of the public stands behind Roe. What happens if the court finds itself going in a direction that is out of step so severely with the public? Yeah, I mean, that's a problem for the court. Um, this was a problem during the Warren Court years because the Warren Court, you know, stood for desegregation, stood for getting organized prayer out of the schools, stood for um, uh, major increased protections for criminal defendants, and a large se segment of the public didn't like any of those things. And so uh, there was a backlash and Richard Nixon ran a very successful presidential campaign um, in 1968, running against the Warren Court. And, uh, you know, with all kinds of dog whistles, you know, he, he couldn't say race and so he said crime and that kind of thing. And, you know, it's, if, if the public is really upset with what comes out of the current court, there will be a backlash in our politics, but it could take a long time. It could take, you know, like with life tenure and so on, um, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. You know, it's so interesting when you talk about the Warren Court, because now we look at a lot of the things they did and they're lauded and we forget that at the time it was not an easy place to stand. No, I mean, there were, I, I've written a, a, a book that deals with some of this. Um, you know, there were yard signs uh, all over the South in Petra Warren. You know, we, we don't see signs today in Peach John Roberts, so we're, we're kind of beyond that. But, um, uh, but yeah, there'll be, if the court does overturn or, or functionally overturn Roe, there'll be, um, I'm sure, a major political backlash. Do you think RBG is looking down from wherever she is and regrets that she didn't retire earlier? I think you kind of got into this at the start. Yeah. I, I, My guess is she's focused on what's going on where she is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Where they still need all the help they can get. Um, let's see. I'd, um, they'd like to ask you for perspective about the quarter long across your long career. Have things ever been this bad before or is there reason for optimism? And I will note, um, it was an honor and a joy to interview Justice Sotomayor uh, a few years ago. And I was struck by her optimism, which was based in belief in America and in the constitution that she thought that what was right would always prevail. Yeah, that's great. Um, you know, have, ever, have things ever been this quote bad before? Um, I mean, I'm sure they have. Uh, and I think there is a built-in corrective mechanism. Uh, I think a lot of our problems uh, do not begin and end at the, with the US Supreme Court. And certainly do not begin and end with the fact that Ruth Ginsburg chose not to retire. Uh, some people seem to think that, you know, that, 
that's the root of all of our evils today. Um, so, you know, I think our our problems are caused by politics and they're going to have to be solved by politics. Is there any hope to ever overturn Citizens United? What would have to occur? Which, I mean, why don't you explain for people who don't know? I mean, that, it was such a substantial ruling in terms of money in our politics. Yeah, so Citizens United, which was in 2010, I think, um, it was a First Amendment ruling that uh, got rid of limits on the amounts that corporations could spend in politics. Um, I don't actually, so will Citizens United ever be overruled? Um, not by the current court, certainly. Uh, and I'm not sure that as things have evolved that it's had the, the kind of cataclysmically negative impact standing alone as an opinion, as a decision of the court that people thought it would because the way things have developed online and, and different ways of conveying political messaging. Um, you know, I think certainly Democrats have held their own in fundraising. Uh, it hasn't been a huge advantage, I don't think, to Republicans. So I think we've kind of moved on from, uh, you know, the notion that Citizens United was going to totally wreck our politics. There's lots of other threats to our politics uh, deeper than, than that, at least in my opinion, as a citizen. You know, often, and I think Gorsuch in the book a couple of times says, you know, this is not the role of this court. What you want is for Congress to do, Congress to do its job and legislate and follow through. And I'm thinking about voting rights. We've seen the voting rights, uh, the John Lewis Act can't get out of the House and definitely won't make it past the Senate. And they don't seem to be getting much ground. And then when you look at the court on that issue, John Roberts, if we want to stop discriminating by race, we need to stop discriminating by race. The ruling in the Arizona case, they just seem to be picking apart uh, our understanding of voting rights. Is there any redress on an issue like this? Or do we essentially find that he can say that, that the legislature should do something, but the American public is going to find itself with no redoubt to go to? Yeah, that's extremely serious. Um... I don't, you know, I'm not smart enough to, to know how we get our way out of the cul-de-sac that we're in, uh, kind of a, a vice of politics have given us a judiciary that does not seem responsive as in the Arizona voting rights decision that came down at the end of this last term that I, that I write about in the book, uh, responsive to the basic, um, aspect of democracy, which is that everybody can vote. Uh, extremely serious problem with, with uh, you know, the gerrymandering of the House, just a part of it, which of course the Supreme Court has also refused to address. Um, so there is a kind of a, a synchrony between our, our political lockup and the political branch and the lockup in the judiciary. And so, serious problem. Uh, you're getting a couple of questions about court packing. Joe Biden has said, you know, you guys, somebody will study it, but he doesn't seem open to expand the number of jurists beyond nine. Do you have a personal opinion on whether or not to do that? I don't really. I've tried to keep myself agnostic on it. Um, I, you know, I, I, I get the argument, but it's Really, at this point, it's no more than a thought experiment because uh, it's it, it can't happen with our current Congress. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's just not going to happen. You know, you've talked about the fact that Trump seemed to think that having three nominees was his ace up the sleeve and it didn't work out the way that he thought. Someone asked, with such a polarized court, are there concerns re Trumpism in the future? How can the justice system be protected? if rules can potentially be bent at will. Is that something you're thinking about? If we saw a second Trump term, if he was able to get justices on the court who were really, 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 really more in line with his philosophies and super right thinking where the court might end up. Oh, 
<laughs> that's a nice thought, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> I think that ha had the court done what Trump wanted it to do and basically became a tool of invalidating the 2020 election, um, the court would have destroyed itself as an institution. Uh, so, you know, if the same thing repeated itself in 2024 under the scenario that you just described, um, you know, makes me shudder to think about it. So that's, <laughs> let's not think about it. Okay. We're coming to the end of our time here. And You've written many books about the court. You've spent 30 years covering it. You probably have many more columns and books to go. And I just wonder what usually pops in your mind as you think back over, not just your vocation, your avocation, you clearly do this because you love this and you're fascinated by it. When you look back over your career covering the court, what most of all comes to mind about this institution? Ah, uh, you know, on one level it's, it's mystery, it's power. Um, the, the ultimate question of, you know, why do we do what it tells us to do? Um, a, a, a mystery that goes way back to the founding. Uh, you know, when I went there every day for almost 30 years, um, you know, I never, I never felt jaded about walking into that building. Um, I, you know, I, I, I I respect it and I hope for the best for it. So in the questions that have come up here about, you know, the possibilities for doing great damage to the country, it makes me, you know, worried and sad, but, um, uh, but it, but you're absolutely right. I mean, it's played a very important role in my, in my professional and, and, and personal life. Well, Linda, it has been an honor to spend some time with you this hour. As, as most people who are tuning in, when I see your name on a piece in the New York Times, I go, I got to read this one. And so thank you for the book and thank you for your career. Well, thank you for such a good interview and um, good luck to you too. All right. All the best. Bye-bye.